Um, so welcome everyone and thank you for joining us this afternoon. Um, before we begin, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land on which I'm speaking to you today, the Camaragal people, and to pay my respect to their elders past, present and emerging. Um, my name is Kelly Mitchell from the Historical Services team at Stanton Library. And today I have the pleasure of introducing North Sydney Council's historian, Dr. Ian Hoskins, for the latest in our online um, history talk series, A Model for Others, the History of St. Thomas's Rest Park. Um, this is a continuing series, as you're probably aware. So um, please keep an eye on our website for further details of upcoming talks. And if you've missed any of the previous talks, then you can um, find those recordings online. If you just search our website for history talks, you'll find the links to the previous recordings. Um, uh, if you have any questions during this talk, feel free to add them into the chat box and I can put them to Ian for a short Q&A session at the end of his presentation. But if you have any general inquiries, um, such as requests for digital images or even volunteering at this site that Ian's about to tell you a bit more about, then um, feel free to email us at localhistory at northsydney.nsw.gov.au. Um, and now I'll hand over to Ian. Thank you. Thank you, Kelly. I hope you can hear me okay. Does yep. that sound, sound okay to you? It does. Yep, oh good. Okay, well thanks everyone for um, logging on. I've got the wrong title. <laughs> I didn't put a, a model for others, I've just put St Thomas's Cemetery History. And um, the model for others turned up in an early, uh, I think it was a newspaper article from the 1840s suggesting that the, the cemetery would be a model for others. I've, I've seen no other evidence of that, so um, I can't really elaborate on whether it served as a model for other cemeteries or not. Anyway, what, what you can see there is the, the most notable monument in St Thomas's Cemetery or St Thomas's Rest Park as it's known today, and that's the, the Wollstonecraft Berry Pyramid. Um, which dominates the landscape. They're <laughs> I'm surrounded by trees uh, just before the place was re-landscaped in the early 1970s. I'll talk a bit about that later. Um, there's the, the cemetery. Uh, the West Street is at the top. The address today is 250 West Street, Crow's Nest. You can go up there and have a look at it. That's how heavily populated it was uh, I suspect that map was drawn up in the 1960s, um, so it would reflect its state at the last interment, which was 1950. And the, the large square that you can see sort of in the top middle there, that's the pyramid. Uh, and perhaps if I can see my cursor, there's the cottage there and, and there's West Street. The cottage is uh, the front room of the cottage. Here is a museum. Did the redid the exhibition there, I think in 2016. And it still stands up. I'm quite proud of that one. So uh, get along on Thursday afternoons. Uh, that's open, operated by a volunteer. If you're interested in volunteering, you can get in touch with Kelly as well. I, I'm not sure if it's open on Saturday mornings again, is it? Have we gone to Saturday mornings, Kelly? I'm not sure, but we can confirm that. Not currently, but um, depends on volunteer uptake. So my oh, volunteer uptake. Okay, yeah. So if you want to help out on a Saturday morning, a um, lot of dog walkers in the park, kids, people wandering around, so we get passers by. Now you can tell um, that there are two two distinct parts of the cemetery. Here is the oldest section the monument that i oh, sorry the pyramid was the first monument in the park uh, and you can see these other ones here taking their orientation from the pyramid uh, these tend to be larger graves where they've uh, survived those tabletop or altar type um, graves which are a large oblong of, of sandstone often surrounded by a, a paling fence there are some of those still in the in the park today um, but here and here you can see lots of smaller grave plots and 
back in the day, these would have been, um, well, they may have had more than one body in them, one, one on top of the other, as, as is suggested by the register. We have a copy of the register in the museum, but they would have generally had a fairly standard tablet type headstone. And I'll show you some photographs of those later on. I'll, I'll talk also about the, the landscaping of the, the, the re-landscaping of the park later on as well. So I won't sort of get ahead of myself too much, but this is how it originally looked well up until the, the mid 20th century. Um, so really densely settled, there's four and a half acres there and perhaps as many as 5,000 interments, if you can believe that, they're the figures that I've read anyway. Um, a lot of this area now is is lawn. So the heaviest populated area of the of the cemetery is now the most open. Um, but these older, larger monuments survive in parts. Um, all the all the bodies are still there. There were no exhumations, even though people were given the option of having the the remains of um, ancestors. Uh, exhumed and taken off somewhere else in the 1960s. And here is the location of the park uh, on this 1887 map. You can see West Street there. Significant because this is the, the Berry estate, originally the Wollstonecraft estate and inherited by Alexander Berry uh, after his wife Elizabeth died in 1845, very relevant, as you'll find out. Um, her brother was Edward Wollstonecraft, after whom the suburb is named. Um, so you can see the name there, E. Wollstonecraft, 524 acres. And that land all passed into possession of Alexander Berry. Um, well, Edward died in 1832, goes passed on to his sister Elizabeth and then to Alexander, who was married to Elizabeth, and she dies in 1845. Uh, so you can see how close it it is to the estate and the reason there is that Berry added to this um, huge original land grant which was which was made in 18, gee, 1819 I think possibly 1821 but 1819 um, to, to this pink land here and Berry bought this extra parcel here and he was able to give that little plot of land to the Anglican church when Elizabeth died in 1845, because there was no other burial site, European burial site on the north side of Sydney Harbour. Um, his house, which he was just completing in 1845 when Elizabeth died, you know, tragic story, um, is here. And that's the site essentially of the Dem School to orientate yourself yourselves. This is, this Lane Cove Road is essentially the Pacific Highway today. So the Dem School with the big palisade fence around it, um, with the gardens of Crowsness House, which was the seat of Alexander Berry and Elizabeth. Um, she dies before the house is, is completed. Um, there, if I can get my cursor going again, is St. Thomas's Church. And so the cemetery is some distance, a good kilometre and a half from the church, but that's because the church was built without a cemetery and in 1845, coincidentally, and Berry was able to give a plot of land um, to the church as a cemetery. Even though I suspect he was a Presbyterian, he may have converted to, Angl um, to the Church of England. Uh, I don't have any proof of that, but if he, if he did, it would be because he was fed up with John Dunmore Lang, who was the radical Presbyterian um, minister in Sydney at the time, and the two were forever exchanging barbs in the press. Uh, Berry was a Tory um, and Lang was a radical Democrat, so they didn't enjoy each other's politics. Um, and Berry became very close to the, the rector of St. Thomas's, the new rector of St. Thomas's, who was the Reverend William Clark. And there's Berry there, obviously later in life, of estimated 65 to 73. He dies in 1873 and is himself buried under the the pyramid. He joins his wife Elizabeth, and also um, Edward Wollstonecraft is is there in a crypt beneath the pyramid. He had died, as I said, in 1832, buried over um, at the first burial ground 
in the city, which is underneath the present town hall. And so he was exhumed uh, to join his sister, I think in 1846. And then Alexander dies in 1873. So the three bodies under the, under the pyramid. And there's the, the first church, first St. Leonard's church, um, designed by uh, an architect called Hume. And I suspect, or, or no, I don't suspect, I know from the writing of um, Cameron Spark, uh, who was a member of the historical society, who wrote a really good article on the pyramid and I think his name was Henry Hume and the church for the North Shore Historical Society Journal. And so he did a lot more digging than I've done on the architectural origins of the church, the first church, um, and the designer of the pyramid. And it would make sense that the designer of the church would have designed the pyramid, which is the first of the significant monuments in the park. Um, the, the second church, the one that's there today, was built by uh, the Blackett brothers and finished in 1883. So the first church was too small by that stage. There were only a few hundred people living in what was called St. Leonard's, which was the, the area from present day Wollstonecraft all the way across, including Mossman. Um, but enough of them were Anglicans to warrant um, building a church for them in the, in the 1840s. You can see the forest behind there. So the, the area, and we're looking to the north, um, so the area given to the church by Berry would have been heavily forested at this stage. And I don't think it was completely cleared straight up. So it would have been cleared in patches as, as um, burials were, were made. There's Reverend William Branwright Clark, known as the father of Australian geology, because he <laughs> was as interested in geology, geology as he was in theology. Um, and he was a good friend of Alexander Berry. Berry actually gave him a, a plot of land to build a really nice house on, on his estate when he retired. So they lived near each other and made neighbours and good friends. There's a 1853, or the detail of a, a trig survey of Port Jackson, and you can see a couple of main roads. Um, th this is essentially Blues Point Road, as it is today, gazetted in 1838, when the township of St. Leonard's, which is hardly a township, lots of dotted buildings, as you can see here. Um, not even the, the main streets noted here by Thomas Mitchell, which is interesting. The, the, the main area of North Sydney today is a grid of streets, which was the, um, the land that remained in crown hands to be sold off. All this area here had been granted to uh, various individuals. Edward Wollstonecraft, as I said, in 1819 or 1821, this area to Billy Blue in 1817, and pretty well all of Neutral Bay over there was bought by John Piper, I think in 1814 or thereabouts. Anyway, way up high is what's called there the St. Leonard's Church, was um, uh, St. Thomas's Church, and no sign of the cemetery on that, but it's it's beyond up here. And this is the road that eventually becomes military road heading off towards towards Mossman. This is one of the first and one of the very few artworks of the park that I've found. Took a bit of scratching around actually, um, looking at the, the State Library art collection, also looking at which, which is where this is from. I haven't acknowledged that I should have put that up there. Um, and the National Library of Australia has one or two paintings too. Um, very accessible now because of how much has been digitised, so you can look at their various catalogues on online. Um, but it did take a bit of uh, ratting around because a lot of Conrad Martin's um, watercolours and sketches are in books, are in collections, sketchbooks, and and other. Collections of his works, and and they're not individually catalogued items. So I, I essentially went through every book of drawings or um, watercolors by Conrad Martins, knowing there's a good chance that Conrad Martins would have uh, painted or drawn the park because he lived in 
North Sydney from at least 1838. He had a house called Rockley Grange down in present day Edward Street. Um, so it, it would have been extraordinary if he hadn't gone up and, and painted a cemetery in the middle of the bush. You would have thought that was perfect material for an artist. So I found this, even though it's an untitled watercolour, and I'm not quite sure what that um, grave refers to. A little bit hard to, to read the dates, but that may be 1854, 1864, so somewhere within that range I've, I've suggested. There's Conrad Martins there later in life, and he indeed is buried up in the cemetery. So one of the very many notable um, individuals from North Sydney who's buried at St Thomas's. Now this is this is the most exciting artwork I found. This is in the National Library of Australia collection. Um, I was really I was really delighted to find this uh, because it's the only representation of the pyramid um, from the 19th century, even the early 20th century, which I found astounding because you would have thought a sandstone pyramid in the middle of the Australian bush would have um, <laughs> been an ideal subject for a, an artist or even at this point a photographer because photography was um, available to those who could afford it from the, the 1840s and certainly the 50s and 60s and 70s in Australia but I've yet to find a photograph of the pyramid um, in any of those uh, decades but this is one by a, a, an artist called E.W. Brooker about whom I know absolutely nothing at all uh, but this is the grave of Owen Stanley, Royal Navy, looking towards the pyramid. And you can still stand, he's, he's played with the vantage point or the angles a little bit, um, but you can still see both of those in the park because Owen Stanley's grave at a tabletop or altar style monument, as you can see there, still survives in the, in the park with its original palisade iron surround. Um, so I've got a representation or a reproduction rather of that painting on one of the signs there in the in the park. You can see how much bush is still there uncleared. Um, oh, there it is today. Looking now, let me orientate you. So the monument, the pyramid would be over to the right hand side of this. Interesting, if I go back there's not the the wall around that, or at least he hasn't shown that. So I'm guessing that's fairly original. I can't imagine someone would have built that subsequently or with the landscaping, but I could be wrong. Very faded inscription on top, but we do have um, a record of at least the, the biographical data on the inscriptions. We have copies of all those uh, in the collection. I've been meaning to somehow get a drone or a camera up to get a good copy of the inscription on top of the, the monument there to make sure that we have all the information there. Now, actually, let's go back and talk about Stanley. Stanley was the um, captain of the Rattlesnake, which was a Royal Navy survey vessel that went up the east coast of uh, what was then all uh, New South Wales in 1849 to do a proper or comprehensive survey of the coast. People had sailed around Australia by then several times. Um, Flinders was the first, uh, but they were always seeking to improve charts of the coast to make sure we, uh, the captains and things knew where reefs were and inlets and coves. Um, and Stanley was one of those. And he went all the way up to New Guinea, uh, the Louisiana Islands off the southeast of New Guinea. And the Owen Stanley range that uh, cuts along the, the middle of New Guinea is named after after him. Um, Thomas Huxley was on the Rattlesnake in 1849, who was well known because of his association with Charles Darwin. He was researching jellyfish at the time, a um, member of the Royal Society. And um, Oswald Briley, the marine painter, was also on board. Uh, he had been Ben Boyd's whaling station manager down at Twofold Bay, believe it or not, up until 1849 and Boyd pushed off to California in 1849. I'm not sure whether he paid everything he owed to Oswald Brealey, but um, Brealey got a gig on the 
rattlesnake and just as well because he he created a really wonderful record artistic record of of the journey well the the rattlesnake is back in sydney harbour in 1850 and owen stanley dies on board possibly of a disease he's caught up in the tropics um and he's a long way from home he's an englishman but he had an association with um the Reverend Clark, who was a man of science and was exchanging letters and observations with explorers and scientists all over the world. And so uh, Clark agreed to preside over the service for Owen Stanley and did so at the still relatively new St. Thomas's Church. And hence Owen Stanley was buried in this five year old cemetery on the top of the hill. Um, there was no Rookwood at that stage. There was no Gore Hill. Rookwood was 1869. Gore Hills, um, I think, opened for burials in the 1870s. Um, and possibly at that stage, they were transferring uh, bodies from that original uh, grave site, graveyard, again, where the town hall is today, up to the Sand Hill Cemetery around Devonshire Street, what then became Central Station. Um, so that may explain why Owen Stanley wasn't buried there. But I, I, I think the better explanation is that um, Clark agreed to be the, the presiding rector at his, at his um, funeral and did so in his new church because he had an association with him. And Stanley's uh, burial in, the, in St. Thomas's started a tradition in my mind, I've got no documentary proof of this, but I'm reasonably confident that this is the case, an association with uh, the cemetery and the Navy, initially the Royal Navy and then the, the Royal Australian Navy, um, so that St. Thomas's becomes an unofficial naval burial ground. Hundreds and pro probably thousands of people uh, walk beside the casket as, as uh, Owen Stanley's casket as it was taken up um, on a carriage from what was probably Blues Point at that point, um, up Blues Point Road and then to the cemetery. So a bit of a, a journey with a, a horse and carriage, um, but such was Owen Stanley's um, esteem. He, he was a significant person in the Royal Navy and the Royal Navy was um, very much respected in far-flung colonial Sydney, as you'd understand. The, the, the burial then of James Goodenough in 1875, and this is a photo photograph probably from the year after, really clinches that in my mind because he was the Commodore of the Australia station on Garden Island. Um, that this, the Royal Navy came to have a permanent presence in Sydney Harbour from 1859 and Garden Island was their naval station, hardly developed in the 18. 60s and 70s, but much more so in the 1880s. Um, there was a flotilla of at least a dozen vessels by by then. Um, being the Commodore, he he was in charge of everything that happened with the with the flotilla. Needless to say, but he also um, took command of the the flagship at that time, which was HMS Pearl, and went off as a as a naval officer himself and in 1875 went to the Solomon Islands, uh, specifically Santa Cruz, to follow up um, some disputes and violence that had occurred there as a result of uh, blackbirding, which was the kidnapping of islanders for um, indentured labour in the sugar plantations of far north Queensland, uh, an industry which had had taken hold in the 1860s and well, well and truly up and going by the 1870s. Um, and that business of blackbirding wasn't, um, well, caused a lot of tension up in the island. So there was a dispute up at Santa Cruz. Good enough went up there on the Pearl and was walking through a village and was hit by poison arrow or a dart. Um, and he died of tetanus on board the Pearl on the way back to Sydney Harbour. Now, his funeral was huge. I mean, there was perhaps as many as 10,000 people uh, lined the, the roads, which probably from Milson's point at that point, um, all the way up to St. Thomas's Cemetery. He's buried there with several of his, uh, uh, several other sailors on, on the Pearl who were also killed 
on that journey. Um, and by that stage, Rookwood was open. So the fact that uh, St. Thomas's was chosen for such a high ranking naval officer suggests to me that it, it had a, um, a function as a, a naval cemetery, it really does. And this is a whole uh, um, barriered off area for sailors. You can see the chain and the anchors there. So there are several seamen buried in there. Um, here's a, uh, an image of his funeral or the, the cortege heading up. That says Wilson's Point, it should say Milson's Point there. But they pulled that all the way up to Crow's Nest from, from Milson's Point. And there's the the monuments today. The the area around it has contracted a little bit. That was a result of all the re-landscaping that went on in the 1970s. Um, and the anchor and and chain around there had um, rusted away by the 1960s. But North Sydney Council got the blacksmith, the last of the blacksmiths on staff to, to make moulds of the original corner posts, the, the chain and the anchors. And he forged these wonderful replicas in iron. So they're, they're up there today. So everything there is original, it's just been reconfigured slightly, but on pretty well the, the original location of Goodenough's grave. And there are many other um, uh, ratings and, and offices up in St. Thomas's. So it's a, it's a really interesting site for that reason. Okay, let's talk a bit about the, the style of the monuments. Um, these are the two of three, a little um, trio of Latin crosses. Uh, these mark the, the Badham family graves. Charles Badham was a professor at Sydney University. Um, and you can see another Latin cross at an angle on the corner, and you can see the, um, the pyramid behind there as well. This is an Anglican cemetery, so Christian symbolism you would think it'd be um, common, and it is, lots of crosses and crucifixes to be seen, um, and lots of Christian imagery. Um, there's another um, beautifully carved in sandstone. Sydney being a sandstone city, um, it's not surprising that sandstone was is the most common uh, material used for the headstones at St. Thomas's. Uh, marble is the second most common, uh, less so uh, granite. Um, and granite is the most durable, sandstone the least durable, uh, but sandstone is also the most plastic, which means um, the detail that was achieved in the, um, the headstones is just remarkable. This one still stands up there, Sarah Jane Porter's headstone. It's weathered a little bit, but most of that detail is there. And um, the king, the, the crowns, sorry, and the, the cross is symbolic of the, the kingdom of heaven. This is interesting. This is the oldest uh, pair of monuments up there because they were relocated to the, to the cemetery in the 1880s. Um, but the tabletop or altar monument below is as old as possibly 1815 when Ellis Bent, who was the judge advocate under Macquarie, died, or possibly 1825 when his body was relocated from um, the main burial ground in the centre of town, again where the town hall is today, to Garden Island. Um, and in 1825 also, uh, John Ovens, Major John Ovens, who was an engineer, army engineer, who'd come out earlier, uh, met um, Ellis Bent, and obviously developed a very close relationship with him in 1811 or thereabouts, because he left again in 1812. Uh, and when he'd come back again with Governor Brisbane in 1821, um, uh, Ellis Bent had died, yet Ovens had asked for his body to be buried in uh, Bent's grave, which is extraordinary. I, I really don't know any more about their relationship, but it was obviously a very close one, despite the fact that they knew each other only really in the colony for a year, unless they had a firm friendship before that. Um, 
anyway, that monument was built for ovens on top, which is another form of pyramid, which is, of course, Egyptian classicism. So there's nothing Christian about that at all. Uh, but that's the one that either ovens chose or someone chose four ovens with four cannonballs because he's a military man served in the Peninsula Wars um, holding it up. So that that pairing of the two monuments existed on Garden Island. And then when Garden Island was uh, further developed as a naval base in the 1880s, they had to be re relocated. And where did they take them? Well, they didn't take them to Rookwood. They took them to St. Thomas's Cemetery where there was this association with the Navy. So again, another example of um, how there was a link between the Navy Garden Island and St. Thomas's. It's a close up of that. Um, most of beautiful cursive writing there in the sandstone must have taken an age to do that. Uh, and none of that is Christian um, eulogizing or, or poetry or versifying. It's, it's all sort of biographical material about uh, John Ovens. The sandstone's lasting reasonably well. Um, and you can see a, a inscription on top of Bent's monument, but I'm, I'm at a loss a little bit to know how to preserve these. They're, they're now significantly old, particularly the Bent monument and some of that sandstone is um, sheeting off. We have had it stabilized by a heritage sandstone, um, well, a, a stonemason, but I'm a little worried about it, but <laughs> the only alternative is to put a huge umbrella over the whole thing, which I imagine wouldn't please the locals very much and would be unsightly. The sandstone weathers. There's the, um, there's the berry pyramid. Now, as far as I'm aware, and I'd love to hear from anyone who's listening or anyone subsequently, uh, this is the only pyramid mausoleum in Australia. And it's, and it's big. Um, it, it stands well over uh, three metres high. Um, they were not uncommon in Britain and France, particularly after the Napoleonic Wars, or, or possibly even because of the Napoleonic Wars. Britain and France fought each other in the Battle of the Nile. Um, the French were already in Egypt and then the British displaced them, but both became intensely interested in, in um, the architecture of <laughs> Egyptian classicism and therefore those who could afford it designed or had designed pyramids for them for when they died. So you, you do come across uh, pyramids in France and Britain, but this is the only one in Australia. It, Berry was also a friend of Charles Nicholson, the classicist, uh, after whom the Nicholson Museum is named. So he had an interest in classicism, but he's a, a Christian man who, who gave uh, land to the Anglican church, yet chose what is essentially a pagan poor form of mausoleum for himself. There's no Christian message or um, symbolism at all on that. And he had it designed for his wife. So he obviously thought very highly of her, or perhaps saw of himself as a, a pharaoh of sorts. So it's really, really fascinating. There's a lot of um, classical or pagan symbolism in the park. The, the funerary urn is the most common. And, and there's a woman um, grieved, leaning over an urn with a shroud over her. The shrouded urn is a reference to Roman cremation practices. Now, cremation wasn't happening in Australia at the time, or not commonly anyway, people were being buried. Um, yet, so interested were the Victorians in classical imagery, perhaps because Britain regarded itself as the new Rome, that this type of pagan iconography was perfectly acceptable in a Christian cemetery. So there are several urns. There are also columns, um, obelisk type columns in the park, which again is a, a classical symbol rather than a Christian one. Um, and this is interesting too, the, the monument to Annie Fitzwilliams, um, because well, it's, it's very old and not dissimilar to Ellis Bent's with the floral um, motifs on that base. But this is the only representation of a human figure in the park. There are no angels in St. Thomas's Park. There are none that survive and none that I can find in the photographic record 
of those monuments that were standing in 1965, which is a good record of, of the park, you know, so I imagine that they, they never were angels. Um, angels are most associated with Roman Catholic cemeteries, uh, and this is an Anglican one, but it's not out of the question for Anglicans to have angels. Um, it would be unusual for a Presbyterian or a Methodist to have an angel anywhere near their, their monument, but, but less so with Church of England. So it is interesting that there's, there are no angels there, um, but there's, that's possible. Oh, I can't imagine that's, or maybe that is Annie Fitz, William. I'm not sure who that person is, but seemingly a female. Lots of floral imagery, um, which again is potentially pagan. It's not always necessarily uh, Christian. That, as far as I can tell, is um, a Madonna lily, interestingly, with a broken stem. And I think the broken stem is purposeful. It's not that it's broken off. Uh, and th there are books written about the symbolism, symbolism of flowers. One flower can have many associations. Um, but from what I've read, but Madonna lily symbolizes resurrection, which is entirely appropriate for a, a Christian monument. Um, I'm also um, thinking that people in, in the 19th century and certainly in earlier centuries would have been far more familiar with the symbolism of flowers than we are today. I mean, pe people think of uh, rosemary as, a, as symbolizing remembrance and hence the use of ro rosemary around um, November 11, Armistice Day. Uh, but there's a, a plethora of association with a whole variety of different flowers um, and most of it's forgotten. So fortunately we have um, quite a few books that list the, the different associations with various flowers. From what I can work out, that's a rose and rose buds at that, um, which symbolize innocence, which is again appropriate for um, remembering someone who's passed. Well, that person's not particularly young at 59. That headstone doesn't survive. I don't recognize that one. These photographs, these black and white photographs were taken by Errol Lee Scarlett, who is one of the founders of the um, Australian Genealogy Society. So very interested in family history and started an interest in family history in Australia in the 1960s. I'm pretty sure he lived locally, but he took a, a leading um, role in working out what to do with St. Thomas's cemetery as it became more and more um, run down in the 1960s. And he began by documenting all the surviving headstones, hence the number there, 544 is the number given to each, each stone has a number. And he took really clear photographs, so we're indebted to, to him. This is a, um, uh, a marble headstone on a sandstone base. And whereas the sandstone uh, monuments, the inscriptions are, are carved into the stone, here they are carved, but then over the top is lead lettering and you can see some of that lead has dropped out. More typically, um, the lettering would have been picked out with um, small pinholes and the lead lettering pushed into the pinholes. And when that falls out, you've only got this um, little line of of dots to try and discern what the what the um, the writing would have said. Some of those survived too. It's a really beautiful one. This one doesn't survive. I'm I'm pretty sure I would have noticed this. Al almost 18th century in its design, um, which is not surprising because it's one of the earlier ones at 1855. But there's the the peace dove with a um, a twig of olive there. And it took a while to, to read that in, inscription, but kind angels watch this sleeping dust till Christ appears to call the just, or may she wake in, oh, may she wake in sweet surprise and in her saviour's image rise. I looked that inscription up and it turns up in North America and elsewhere. So it's a, it's a standard inscription, possibly it comes from the Bible, I'm not sure. She's only, she, oh, 43 years, I originally thought that was, 13, but she's 43 years old. Really, really beautiful stonemasonry. 
on some of these. And unfortunately, some of those that survive have some of the loveliest carving there. The association here is fairly obvious. Angus Mackay almost certainly was a sailor. Um, several monuments survive with that anchor motif on them. And clearly the people who are buried there are, are sailors. Safe home, safe home in port. So, yeah. He died at, um, I looked him up uh, in the newspaper um, listings and he died at the Commodore Hotel, the old Commodore Hotel in Blues Point Road, but it didn't tell me any more about him. Here's a typical, uh, oh, well, this is 1901, so it's not typical Victorian, is it? It's, it's, it's just clocked on into the Edwardian age, but it would represent the um, remembrance cards from the Victorian era as well. Again, those motifs, flowers, birds appear on here. I'm pretty sure that's a daisy um, midway here. Yet another flower that symbolizes innocence, but also purity and gentleness. And I looked up Errol Lee Scarlett's photographs and found that monument there, which is the one to William Butcher. Um, this almost certainly was marble and there's the lead lettering in the marble um, and this doesn't survive. So it's already smashed up in 1963 or thereabouts when Errol Lee Scarlett did his photographic survey. It's a real shame. Those that were badly damaged um, were often discarded when the landscaping happened in the early 70s. Um, this is interesting too and something worth thinking about next time you're up at St Thomas's or looking at any headstone, there will typically be more than one person um, referred to in a headstone. But when you think about it, the headstone would have been put up with the first um, interment, and that is here, Mary, I'm not sure what that second name is, uh, but Mary Butcher. So she dies in 1883, aged 34, 54 years, and then also William, so this must have been put on subsequently in 1901. So a, a stonemason or a, someone specialising in lettering would have come along to St Thomas's and put that on. This space would have been left um, purposefully after 1883 for other members of the family. And then in 1902, Samuel Butcher's name is put there. So you need to think about that when you look at a, a headstone and sometimes the headstone uh, remembers people who predeceased the person who was buried there. And it makes you wonder whether the remains of that person is in fact um, there on site or whether this is just a monument to their memory because they would have died in some instances that their, their, um, their death date is a good 20 years before the, the person whose name clearly is the, uh, the primary name on the monument. So all of these sort of are, are um, mysteries to be solved by those who are using cemeteries as um, clues to family history. Now this is an interesting photograph uh, for understanding Victorian funerary practices and customs. I'm pretty sure that the three women sitting here are in um, mourning dress. Uh, the, the custom was, particularly after the death of Albert in the 1860s, um, with Queen Victoria for very elaborate and prolonged mourning periods really pertaining to women when their husbands or sons or brothers die, um, remaining in, in all black for some time, at least up till a year afterwards. And so the Fell family, when I looked them up, indeed had uh, three deaths between 1889 and 1895, and I assume this photograph was taken sometime during that period. Those who were wealthy enough to be able to afford a whole morning outfit did so. There was a movement against the custom in Australia, interestingly, um, one that was very democratic, saying we, we shouldn't expect people to, to buy a huge um, new set of costume um, each time there's a death in the family. And you can imagine that deaths were fairly frequent in the Victorian period. Um, it's just too expensive. We have in our... Um, I think we have in our collection uh, a black dress from the 1880s and 90s that may be a modified morning dress that was subsequently used as, as a day dress um, 
it's yeah, it, it's a very interesting garment. There's uh, a couple of ads for undertakers who who began appearing on the north side around the 1860s or 70s at this time. These are the oldest ones I've found in the St. Leonard's recorder, which we still have a copy amazingly. I should say that the um, that the practice of wearing mourning costume and outfit ended uh, with the First World War and for obvious reasons there were just so many deaths it became totally impractical to um, to keep wearing mourning garb after that and I make the point talking about that generally when when you're in the city next time you're in the city and you have occasion to go past the old Mark Foy's department store building in Liverpool and Elizabeth Street look up at the facade um, possibly the Castle Ray Street facade, and you will see a listing alongside hosiery and hats or whatever, you will see um, mourning wear. So that building went up in 1907 or 1908, and mourning wear was still a thing, enough of a um, uh, consumer item for them to, to pick it out, to state it in the brickwork or the tile work on the exterior, but uh, just five or six years later, the First World War put an end to that. So I, I find that very interesting. Here is the only image of a, um, a funeral service at St Thomas's Cemetery that I've found. And this is the burial of um, Charles Badham in 1884. So this is interesting. So here's, here's the, um, the service ha occurring at the gravesite rather than in a church. And when I look at uh, newspaper accounts at the time, it's typical for the body to be laid out at the residence of the family's house and for people to be invited to walk with the carriage from the house to the cemetery, in this case St Thomas's, rather than to a church. Um, so that seems to be the custom. So services in a church or a chapel seem to be a 20th century, uh, more a 20th century thing. There's St Thomas's Cemetery in the 1960s. So the first burial in 1845, the last in 1950, and in the years after that, uh, very rapidly St Thomas's falls into disrepair. Um, the church has less and less money to spend on its upkeep and fewer of the descendants of those who were buried there take an interest in it. So it becomes overgrown. in, in a, sense it's looking like what it looked like back in 1845 but with different vegetation I suspect a lot of these are, are weeds and poplars or whatever growing up rather than the original turpentine forest that was here but you can see what a, what a state it's in um, and a lot of those trees would be damaging the, the monuments with roots and things and there was a lot of vandalism too and um, that earlier photograph I showed you of the Badham monument you can see lots of rank grass and I've, I've heard from locals uh, who lived in the area around the time that naughty boys would light the, the grass when it was dry and rank in summer and you know, start grass fires through there. So um, it, it, looked, it looks very picturesque in the 1960s, but was in a state of disrepair and it was decided um, to desanctify it as a, as a cemetery and give it to North Sydney Council as a place to be managed as open space. Um, and that occurred in 1967. And these photographs were taken in the lead up to that. It's possibly another Errol Lee Scarlet photograph, I'm not sure. You can see the condition of the place. Would have been wonderful to wander around. Um, St Stephen's Cemetery over at Newtown would be um, the, the most obvious comparison, although there are much larger trees there now, but you wander around and see um, headstones and things toppling over there. The monument on the left there is still there. And here's Errol Lee Scarlet again with his survey, in this case holding up a little plate with a number on there rather than drawing on the monument. Not sure if the Curtis monument survives, I suspect it doesn't, I don't recall seeing it there. But that's sandstone. Here's a marble um, tablet headstone 
clearly been smashed and it looks like it's been smashed by a vandal uh, with the lead lettering. Almost certainly that doesn't survive. And here's how the place was re-landscaped um, in the early 70s by Ashton Powell and Taylor. Uh, a decision was made, and I, and I haven't found the documentation listing those monuments and headstones that were to be discarded, but um, most of them were. The broken ones, I suspect, were decided because it was thought it would be too expensive to put them back together again. Um, the purpose was to create open space as a park, so they couldn't simply just um, reinstate all the all the headstones. So those that were broken were removed. I suspect a lot that were not broken were removed too. And again, I, I'm not quite sure how that decision was made. The larger ones, like the most obviously the pyramid, it was it was a clear decision to leave those where they are. And, and it was also, I'm sure, thought that the larger ones indicated people of more historical significance and Um, but several of the smaller ones were moved into precincts uh, and here's an area here. So when you go to St. Thomas's today, you'll see groupings of headstones in graveled areas, one, two primarily, three, a third one there, little grouping up here, some of those in original location. But this vast expanse of lawn here is where most of the graves actually are the body's under there, but this is where people throw balls for dogs and things. Um, so that's, and, and then lots of trees planted, which weren't there originally. Um, so it's a very different place today than it was in 1845 or 1950. We have to deal occasionally with vandalism, um, but, but not as often as you'd imagine. Um, usually happens in sort of 10 year, 10 year cycles for some reason, and then people will go at several of them at once, but we, we're quick to repair those monuments that are knocked over. That one has been repaired, as was another on that occasion. Um, after the park was turned into a, um, uh, sorry, the cemetery was turned into a park and several of the headstones removed, I think uh, several people were given the option to commemorate their descendants with these little plates. So you'll see them screwed into the little uh, barrier walls around the those precinct areas with the gravel within. Um, so almost certainly there would have been one or two or three headstones that no longer survive and the Johnson family sought to commemorate their ancestors this way. There are quite a few of those there. Um, the, the park still has meaning to a lot of people, although the, the ancestors uh, uh, live in the area, I suspect. And I found this note on on the headstone of Augustus William Sewell, who was killed in the First World War. And if he was, his his body certainly isn't here because no bodies were repatriated um, during the Great War or afterwards. They they all lie in France or Belgium or wherever. Um, but someone took the the care to note Sewell's uh, military record and just laminate the or, or put the paper in a in a protective sleeve and and put it on the on the headstone. I found that really interesting around Anzac Day in 2015. And sometimes other people take an interest in the headstone. So in 2016, uh, Skeggs Darlinghurst offered us money to clean up and reiterate the the inscriptions on Edith Badham's headstone. And Edith is here. There's Charles Badham, her father here, and that's her brother there. I think it's William Badham. Um, and this very interesting Calvary trio um, is in its original location in the park. You saw an earlier photograph of it. And so we said thank you very much to um, Skeggs Darlinghurst. And we got the, the sandstone cleaned up and we looked at the inscription to see whether it had been gilded originally or blacked and decided that it had been blacked. And there are people who work at Rookwood Cemetery who are experts in sandstone repair and um, gilding and things. And, and I've worked with them a few times now. So they came and reiterated the lettering. So it's much easier to see and that worked well. 
um, and there's Edith there. Charles lived in North Sydney. Um, she, I suspect, didn't live in North Sydney. Oh, she's in Mossman, actually, I know, in 1920 when she died, but obviously made a decision to be buried with her father and several of her um, siblings and other members of the family. There are quite a few Badhams in the, in the park. Um, in 2015, the Institute of Surveyors said that they'd like to pay for the regilding of Colonel Barney's monument. Um, and that was quite an expensive procedure. Again, we got the people from Rookwood to do that, and it looks really fantastic on, on the granite. Barney was um, a military engineer. He's responsible for Fort Denison and the Argyle Cut and lived in North Sydney, lived in the house Watonga, which is subsequently became Admiralty House. And there they are there, the little plaque that they also paid for laid in front. And this is, I'm going over time a little bit, but this is some work I've done recently at the, uh, on the graveside of John Thomas Gowland, who was a um, naval marine surveyor. That was the condition of his cemetery, or his um, grave, sorry, in the 1960s, looking terrible. We have a photograph of what it looked like originally. And I had an opportunity because the funding worked and we had um, these surviving bits of metal survived in our collection, believe it or not. I just found them by chance and matched them up thanks to this photograph. I thought that's the surround of the Gowland um, gravesite. Well, we got that matched up. We got a heritage metal worker to put that surround on and we got uh, a new Latin cross put on there, expertly cut to size using that as a guide. And the same chap from Rookwood Cemetery re reiterated the lettering. The point of doing this um, was, well, one, to keep people out because <laughs> the ground is starting to subside there and I didn't want people disappearing through on top of John Thomas Gowland for a start. But it gives people an idea of um, how these grave sites looked originally. And there was a link between the Gowland family and the Oliver family. So I wanted to make that clear again. So it's a, it's a work of interpretation and reproduction, which um, I think is entirely valid. You can see uh, a buff color there, believe it or not, this uh, fencing was either colored straw or lavender at the time. It wasn't blacked um, or it wasn't gray. So this is a, an aluminium alloy that we've used here, but ultimately we get it painted in that um, straw color and people will get a, a good idea of what the original grave looked like. This is sandstone and it wasn't uncommon for sandstone to be whitewashed so it looked like marble at the time. And we know that that was the case with the, the Gowland monument from this photograph here. So that's a bit of, um, restoration work that we've done at the park. We also took the opportunity to reiterate um, the grave behind, again, based on photographic evidence, using the moulds from the adjacent good enough um, grave site to recreate Francis Hickson's chain and anchor barrier. He was the president of the Marine Board. So again, uh, um, I wanted to reiterate, uh, to make clear, sorry, the, um, the maritime connections of the park too. Um, here's another example. This is the, the French Tiffin Monument as it survived in 1966. There it is in leaf litter as, as I discovered it in 2015. And these are the only pieces that we could find. Somehow they've been broken up and put into another part of the park. And I got those joined together and returned to where they originally were because they were very close um, to the Blue family monument, and Mary French was originally Mary Blue. So I thought out of respect to Mary, I should put her back where she is, literally. And she married, subsequently married, um, well, she, her first husband was Robert Tiffin, and then she married John French of French's Forest fame, but decided to be buried with Robert and her children. Yeah, very interesting story there. We take school groups through the park. We haven't done so for a while because of COVID, but we did so and those from Camaray Public School, which is not far away, really enjoy those monuments. Kids, kids just love 
finding stuff out about history and going through cemeteries. It, it sounds a bit ghoulish, but they, they, they're not at all freaked out by that and they really get into it. So they're, they're often very enjoyable mornings and they get a lot out of it. And I'll leave it at that because I've gone a bit over my hour, but happy to answer any questions if there are some. Kelly. Thank you very much for that, Ian. That was fantastic. And um, I just wanted to add for those who are not aware that um, the park itself is full of interpretive panels. If you want to take yourself on a walk, guided walk there, or self-guided, I should say, walk around. Um, and there's also walking tour notes that you can um, download from the website that give a lot more information that Ian was uh, giving us information about certain people there, but if you wanted to find out more about people buried there, then that would be a great place to, um, to go. Um, so I do have a couple of questions, or one question anyway, at least, on the chat here. Um, Linda Rosenman said, um, when the cemetery was re-landscaped, was an inventory made of all the deaths and dates and inscriptions from the graves that were landscaped over? Yes, in fact, it happened before before that because of Errol Lee Scarlett. So he did a complete list of all the inscriptions, which we have copies of. Um, and he also numbered that original plan that I showed you so that we can, thanks to Errol, work out where certain bodies are. If, if people say great grandfather was buried in St. Thomas's uh, cemetery and the, the headstone is long gone, we can still find a fairly, uh, with, with some, certainty where the body would be. And we've done that on several occasions for people who are chasing up their family histories. Um, yes, yeah, so that, that did happen. We, we've got very good records of the park and we've got um, copies of the original burial register too. Was there another question did you, did I miss? Um, there's a, a note just for, from James Gibson saying for future note, it's the institution of surveyors, not the institute. I don't know if that's oh, what sorry. Uh, thank you, James. The clerk there says. Um, Andrew, I think this might be our colleague at council, Andrew Beveridge. He says, what happened to the headstones that were removed? Many councils use them in retaining walls and harbour works. Yeah, we, as far as I know, count, North Sydney Council didn't do that. Um, but I suspect some of them are under the raised bit of the um, re-landscaped St. Thomas's Rest Park at the Huntington Street end, so the, the south west end, because it's much built up there. Uh, and also I've heard that some of them were dumped at Tunks Park, but I've not come across any documentation of that. So, yeah. I'm pretty sure that when that there was no I'm pretty sure there was no response to the notice for um, retrieval of exhumed remains. So uh, I get the sense that there was historical interest in the park, but not a lot of actual family interest in in those who were in the um, buried in the cemetery. So that might explain why there was a bit of a cavalier attitude to the to the headstones. Is there another question? Did you? Um, no, those are the only questions we have. There's just a few other notes saying thank you for the interesting talk. So um... I might just add, um, it, it, it is a little bit of an urban myth that bodies were dug up and removed and, and uh, headstones taken away to build the expressway. And I'm pretty sure that's not the case because the expressway just shaves or shaved off um, the northeast part of the, the cemetery grounds in 1970 or thereabouts when the second stage of it was pushed through. Um, but looking at the original layout and looking at the subsequent aerials and things of the area, there were no graves or anything there anyway. So that, that's not the case. And the landscaping was not related um, directly to the building of the expressway although the need for a park um, was understood because there was an awareness that when the expressway was completed and it had been planned from the 1950s that the people of Crow's Nest would be cut off, um, not entirely cut off, but, but um, 
it would be harder to get to Camaray Park. So they were they were in need of some immediate green space. So you know, hence the um, the alacrity with which council said yes, we'll take on the the cemetery in 1967, just as the expressway was nearing completion in its first stage. Okay, thank you for for listening and listening over time. Thank you very much, everyone.